Years later is a series where I take a look back on past pop culture and cinema and see if films that are 10 or more years older still hold up. Today's episode will be on Joyride. It was released on October 5th, 2001. So, does it hold up? What year is it? Whoa. What? <gasps> Thursday. What year? No. What? Year is it? Hold up. So I've never heard of this franchise or series at all when I was looking up on what movies to look up. It just sounded cool. Joyride. I had no idea what was it about or anything. Joyride sounded cool. It had three movies. So I was like, okay, might as well just include the other sequels in it. And it's definitely a unique series of movies that'll definitely stick to you because of Rusty Nail and his big ass truck. They treat this character like a goddamn boogeyman where you don't really see his face. Aside from like the third one, I guess. You see it kind of, kind of visible. But aside from that, we don't really see this character's face except for his voice and it sounds both awesome and creepy. Watching the first one, it did take a while to get to Rusty Nail because you are following Paul Walker and his brother on this kind of road trip trying to meet this girl that he had a crush on way back in the day or, or something along those lines. Most of the characters in the franchise don't really matter. I don't really have an attachment to them aside from knowing them like, hey, look, there's Paul Walker before Fast Ferris and there's some characters from Supernatural. Aside from that, the characters don't matter. It's Rusty Nail. Well, I guess they do matter to an extent because they wronged Rusty Nail from his perspective. So the first one starts off kind of like in this generic road Road trip love romantic thing i don't really like the whole romance thing why are we doing this it does feel like it takes a while to get to rusty nail and it does prolong it throughout the first half where the boys are on the radio messing with people people with trucks and they hear rusty nail they prank him or just they mess with them they just want to have a laugh but that would backfire because rusty nail does not forget and he will get back at you at some point they meet up with the girl and once they're on the road the nightmare begins where he starts knowing their names he knows the specific motels that they're in specific numbers and rooms and that's the part that I really like. Again, they don't show his face at all, which is a big positive for all the films. Just by his voice alone, you get scared because you don't know where he's at, you don't know where he's watching, nobody knows how he's doing these things, and so everyone just kind of frantically panicking and they don't know what to do. Just because of a prank call, just messing with Rusty Nail by the boys, Rusty Nail, he just has to be like, you know what? I'll mess with them. I will scare them off with this car, with my truck, and like he does mess with them with his truck. He almost crashes Paul Walker and his brother in his tree. Then he was like, guess what? I was just messing around, you know? Like, sure. The guy couldn't take a prank or just like a funny laugh, whatever. All right, sure. But going to that extent is really extreme. And then to get even back at them even more, he decides to kidnap the girls. So lesson here is that, you know, just don't mess with the wrong people. Like this is what this film taught me essentially. Don't mess around with the wrong people or just stick to your own. Don't mess with people because someday you will meet the wrong person and they will get back right at you in very extreme ways. What was supposed to be a nice road trip of meeting this girl with his brother tagging along being the third wheel, kind of messing around along the side, the radio turns out to be a nightmare for our characters and a big part of what makes rusty nail scary is the big unknown you don't know his face you don't know which truck he's driving and so that aspect of the unknown is what makes it scary while also seeing the characters panic while also hearing his creepy ass but awesome voice most of the time you're on the edge of your seat because you just don't know what he's gonna do next and funny enough this first movie is like the least extreme or just violent and its sequels it gets more bloody or more kind of violent and the extreme lengths that he goes to is more i guess grand in a way because movie probably money why not go just bigger that cornfield scene where he's chasing them throughout the cornfield that was a really good sequence and then even the whole getting her and then having to find her in the correct room in a certain amount of time that was really intense because if they didn't find her in the amount of time that rusty neil wanted the boys to find her she would have been dead and he does like lie every now and then like he clearly wants revenge over the boys for just kind of messing with them on the radio but he does put a shotgun to the girl's face once they open the door and then the shotgun just blow up right in her face so there is a little deceiving and lying but his ultimate goal is you know just to mess with them just like they did to him but by the end the boys eventually do get to the girl and they save her and then all of the characters that we see on screen survive which i was kind of surprised by Gillies could have killed one you know but hey whatever kind of a happy ending everyone survives this crazy motherfucker rusty nail just drives into the trunk of the motel hurting himself while having one of the girl's friends being captured in his truck somehow he found her again there's like leaps of logic that you kind of get past like how the hell did he find that girl and how the hell did he find that specific radio that one of the brothers threw out because they didn't like it no more they were being stalked by rusty stuff like that where it's like all right that's weird but whatever coincidence right and then there's even like a tease in the end where guess what rusty neil isn't dead he caused them to do like a radio static thing or even like a phone call i think or at least i think either way it doesn't matter because he's alive so tease to having more sequels and whatnot which is fine you know they're treating him like the boogeyman they're treating him like myers or jason getting out of situations somehow some way i'm already accepting the fact that he found this girl somewhere of one of her friends and he somehow found that specific radio on that ground i'm already accepting all of that but 
by accepting this. Sure, whatever. So in the end, Joyride, 20 years later, still holds up. Like, I think the creepiness of it, feeling of being stalked by Rusty Nail is still there. And what, you know, Paul Walker, his brother, and this girl thought was, I guess only the brothers, what they thought was just a tiny little prank call or whatever, just kind of messing around, turned into something else that they didn't expect, which should obviously teach him a lesson of not to just mess around with anyone. You will probably meet the 1% that will just ticked off by one, any one little thing and will get its payback. Don't mess with anyone because one day you might meet that one certain person that will clap back and will ruin your life and try to kill you in a way. So it's still pretty good. And then it's sequels. The only issue that I have with these two films is the fact that they're essentially the same movie, just in different areas. Or maybe not in different areas, but different type of characters that you don't really like, just like the first one. So whenever I like watch all three of these in a row, it's like, I like them, I don't mind them, but they are the same film. And that gets really repetitive and kind of boring. In the second one, there's two actors that I recognize, Nate from Legends and Meg from Supernatural. So this one felt like a CW slash Vancouver-esque type movie, even though it isn't because I only recognize the actors from the CW, but either way, thing about this one is that they're all trying to go to vegas they like bring their friends along well not friends but they flip the script on this one where it's two sisters and then one of the boyfriends and then they meet another boyfriend online dating type stuff and they're all trying to go to vegas but along the way they go to a house turns out to be rusty nails house and they steal his car so that obviously pisses him off and he decides to get his sweet revenge on them this is part of the scariest because there's one moment where he plans on transitioning one of the boys literally not chopping but like probably getting like a rich and taking his dick off well, that shit was scary here is that he's been and then that game that he has nate and that one other guy play as well rolling dice to see which punishment they'll get that was also very scary one thing that they do add and this one's that we see him stalking behind the scenes where they're in a diner and then you see his truck come in he's parking and then looking car and then looking at the people that stole his car and you know it could have been really random but somehow he knows that it's these kids it's these people sitting in a diner and then in frame you see him back out and leave planning his dirty deeds and whatnot and so that aspect i really like like seeing the stalking happen right in front of your eyes without realizing it characters they're fine you just want them to see get killed or see something scary happen to them because you don't really care about them and unlike the first one half of the characters survive one of the sisters and then the guy that almost gets transitioned die in both awesome ways where the guy dies by a pole through his head caused by rusty nail and then rusty nail drives through one of the sisters awesome and then they do end off this movie in an explosion of meg from supernatural driving the truck taking control of it while rusty nails behind her trying to get her out of it there's like an explosion explosion somewhere going to his house and he falls off the cliff with the truck and he somehow survives he comes back with the third film and it's like well all right i guess they're they're trying to commit to this which is fine but it is a bit ridiculous so in the second one rusty nail seems a bit more ruthless he's willing to do things that are much more than just stalking and having creepy phone calls through radios and whatnot he's willing to torture the characters kill them on the spot he embarrassed one of the guys once again and all of it was caused by the character stealing his car now granted this one i'm not saying what he did was right but they did steal rusty nail's car and that you know probably theft but from his perspective it's like you know what time for killing time for revenge and i think in the film he even mentioned the fact that he was tired of work and he was just in a coma and relax and do whatever but then he saw that his car was stolen he said well guess what i gotta start my killing again how he found him no idea he just did don't worry about that oh wait never mind take that back meg left her phone number at his door so there is a reason why he did go after them the exact spot is still very questionable he would have known someone stole it because there was a number left on his door or whatever but finding the specific people for it you know eh, whatever but still good film a fun film a bit more scarier you have something of mine but now i got something of yours the road ahead of us and then the third film has the most characters that I just truly do not give a fuck about. I want to see all of these characters die. The most violent, the most bloodiest, the most gory. That head kill or like car thingy, I don't know what's it called, but he's got one of the guys on his head sideways and crushing it that way. That was really brutal to watch. And then another add-on to this movie is the cop or the section where the cops are not involved, which I do like. I do like that they do acknowledge the fact that one of the characters called the cops and the cops are not involved. They've been looking for Rusty Nail. The only issue is they write these cops like idiots or at least that one cop that's like who thinks that he's found the one and it's like yeah you guys are really right most of these characters like idiots but it doesn't matter you want to see them get killed but it was nice of the film acknowledging the fact that hey there's this killer out there he's been killing people for years now let's see if we can find him and then that opening as well was also awesome drug very hyper sexual active and drug couple they get chained up in front of the truck and they basically have to stay on there because if one of them gets loose both of them will die and that's what happens rusty starts laughing at it it's a brutal kill as well all bloodied up and then they do show a majority of his face with 
which I thought, mm, okay, you know, that's that's fine. You know, I didn't really need to see his face, but they clearly show his face in the light when he's in all that barrel room with that one chick and one really young kid. I really wanted them not to show his face, but as of right now, this is like the last film, so it's like, eh, why not, I guess. Personally, really would have not wanted to have seen his face at all. And then to add on to the more creepiness of Rusty Neal, he like records one of the girls crying and he calls the characters about this one girl. The more the film goes on, the more creepy he gets, the more torturous it feels, telling her what to do and whatnot. And then this one's about, hold on, what's this one about? Oh, racing, there we go. A group of these friends, they want to go on a racing track or whatever, or not racing track, but they want to go to like this racing game. One of the boys, they have like a racing kind of car. Rusty wants that because it looks nice. He likes anything that looks really nice. And then what they do to tick off Rusty is the fact that one of the boys are drivers. There's two cars, but one of them, they like swerve Rusty during like a drive. And so that obviously pisses him off. And that prolongs like a whole racing kind of section early on in the film. Two cars are racing with this big ass truck. The characters eventually win, but Rusty comes out of the truck looking at them. He's not gonna be able to find them somehow, some way. Don't know how, he just is. And then the characters themselves, they're able to like lie to Rusty. He even kills that one younger kid who by the way looked very young. He probably isn't that young, but like it's like a little brother that they took on this race, but he dies for it because they lied to them. And I guess the main guy who's really stubborn and like taking this car to him and willing to go on because all he cares about is essentially himself, but not really by the end. He wants to save his girl, but he's super unlikable for the majority of it. In this film, most of the characters die. The first one, no one dies. And the second one, half the characters die. Most of the characters die except for the main stubborn guy and then another girl who I forgot about. Forgettable characters, but you just want to see Rusty kill all of them. And he is challenged in this film, so I do like that. He's challenged in a way where he's ignored by it and he has to do things on the fly. And like with any sequels, the last sequence and set piece is this large car compound thing? What, what are those things called that like crushes cars? I forgot. It's there. It's where they have a fight. It is forgettable. I'm honestly forgetting what's going on in this section. But all I know is his truck gets into that crushing car thing. And then by the end, everyone thinks they're all fine. They're all good. He even fails for like a fake rusty nail. He comes by. Turns out when they get the truck back up, Neil's gone. He is nowhere to be found. He's on the road somehow. He somehow got out of it without our two main lead finding out or seeing it. Don't know why, but they just didn't. And then he gets in another truck saying that he needs whatever he needs and talks about he's rusty nail and he laughs to end off the film another bruise another way to create more sequels but we never got any more movies after this so i don't know if it's just in limbo or i don't know what's going on but i wouldn't mind a fourth film because i have fun with these films they're not at all bad they're entertaining so the third one's good as well i like it So that's it for the Joyride franchise, a little series. In terms of ranking them, the second one's my favorite, mainly because it's the most scariest to me. Seeing Rusty loom in the background, right in front of our characters, and him having the boys play that game in that shed or whatever, that was really creepy. And then the first one, it does take a while to get to Rusty Neil, but throughout that first half of going to the girl and romantic stuff here and there, love triangle BS, we get pieces of Rusty Neil on the radio. And then the third one, which is my least favorite, but it's still a good film, entertaining. It's clearly the biggest, because it's got a lot of characters that need to be killed off the end sequence of this big garage car thing it's the one that's the biggest and the most gory but the characters suck most of them you don't care for them at all and that goes for all the movies but you really just do not care about the racing guy and then the two girls and then the little brother and then the other friend it's a fun set of movies to go through during the halloween season so i would recommend people watch these films they're fun if you can't take like stalking stuff or like brutal stuff in the second and third film then it's probably not for you but if you just want to be entertained and see some messed up things and see See plans go wrong, joyriding is for you. So that's it for me. This has been The Road So Far and thank you for watching.